So the crowd is, is the students, the postdocs, the mix. Okay, now, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce you Panayota Poyasi. She's in Creta, in Greece. She has, a, she, studied a bachelor, she has a bachelor in mathematics and statistics from the University of Cyprus in Greece. Then she got a master in, of science at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Then she did a PhD there in the year 2000 with Professor Butler Mel, studying the contribution of active dendrites and structural plasticity to the neural substrate for learning and memory. After the PhD, she had a few contracts, and then she got a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellowship to work at Ford, the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology in Creta, where she is now. She was also a visiting scientist at the University of Southern California and the University of California, Los Angeles. She was also a visiting scientist for two years in Charité University in Medicine in Berlin, and three years in the Humboldt University in Berlin. Since 2014, she is a researcher director, or research director, which is equivalent to a, a full professor position at Ford in the Institute of Molecular Biology and Biotechnology. Uh, it's difficult to summarize uh, the many prizes she had, the many papers she published, but I will just mention a few of them at least. Uh, she got several prizes, including the European Molecular Biology Organization Young Investigator Award in 2004. In 2014 and 2015, she was a young scientist and ERC ambassador at the World Economic Forum annual meeting that uh, those years were held, was held in China. In 2018, she got the Frederick Wilhelm Bessel Research Award by the Alexander Humboldt Stiftung Foundation. In 2019, she got the prestigious Einstein Foundation, Einstein Foundation Visiting Fellowship for three years, aided at top level scientists working abroad and in this case acting as a visiting scientist in NeuroCure Cluster of Excellence in Berlin. She has given 95 invited talks, and I, I saw that this talk is already in her TV. Thank you very much, Iota, for, for putting it there. And published more than 72 papers in top journals, uh, including science, nature-ready neuroscience, nature, uh, nature neuroscience, neuron, nature communication, and more. She has also been very active in, in aspect of outreach activities, uh, she's a se section editor of the European Journal of Neuroscience in the section of Computational Neuroscience. She's guest editor uh, in Frontiers in Bioinformatics and Computational uh, Biology, among others. And she's also vice chair in the Fed Open European Innovation Council. But I think it's an interesting, an interesting aspect because uh, some people in this institute have been having the project on the, of the Fed Open area. Her research activity focuses on understanding how dendrites contribute to complex brain functions, such as learning and memory from the theoretical and computational point of view, although the, her group has recently expanded its research activities to include experiments in mice. Today, she's going to talk about illuminating dendritic function using computational modeling, and it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Yota. You can go ahead. Thank you very much, Claudia. That was a great introduction. Too much, maybe. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, all of you today and to talk to you about our work at INDB. As Claudia said, we are expanding to do experiments, but I'm not presenting any experimental work today. Everything I will tell you about today is what we found out with computational models about the really contributions to brain functions. And uh, this is the website of our lab. It's called Dendrites because we really love dendrites. So, dendrites. Their name comes from the Greek word dendron, which means tree. The reason is obvious because they look like trees, right? And they were first described by Camillo Bolgi in 1873 using his famous silver staining techniques. But at the time, people thought that this, these are the dendrites, these extensions. They are just protoplasmic uh, prolongations, which means that they extend from the cell body and their uh, reason to be there is to provide uh, the cell body with nutrients. It was not until 1888 that Ramon y Cajal introduced the neuron doctrine, according to which, to which neurons are the units of the brain, the computational units of the brains, and dendrites essentially serve as the input site for neurons while the action is the output site. So why should we care about dendrites? Well, first of all, because they receive over 90% of the inputs that go into neurons. 
Second of all, because they can compute, which means that they have biophysical mechanisms, mainly ion channels, pumps, uh, receptors, that allow them to shape uh, their signals in nonlinear ways. And this means that they can expand the computational power of neurons. And third, and perhaps most important for all of us, is that they are really important for brain function. And we already know that both the degradic anatomy, the physiology, and uh, their plasticity are affected by various neurodegenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's, which, which lead to memory loss. So if we study and understand dendrites and their computation, we're hoping to shed some new light on this, uh, 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 these uh, diseases. Dendrites come in various shapes and flavors, and this is just a, a picture made by my previous advisor, Bartlett Mel, where it, which summarizes all of this complexity. Pyramidal neurons, which is the one shown here. I, I, I think you can see my cursor, right? Can you no, see my cursor? No? I can't see your, you know, not, not me. Uh, no, no, yes, no, the other thing, yes. You can see it now? Yes. Yeah, okay, so pyramidal neurons, which is what is shown here, are the most extensively studied ones because they are thought to be, let's say, the key computational unit of the brains. But we have a lot of other principal neurons and interneurons that are shown here whose dendritic trees can be highly elaborated. For example, in the Perkin G cell, which is what is shown here, it looks like a, a flat fan. And the question is, why do we have all this complex morphology in these cells? It must be for a reason. They must be performing some important computation. So what the scientists discovered a few years back, um, after the 2000s, I believe, was that dendrites of uh, pyramidal neurons are capable of generating nonlinear events. These events come in the shape of spikes. For example, we have the sodium spikes, which are fast rising and they remind us of the action potentials that are generated at the cell body. And this, for example, is sodium spike shown here, which happens in the dendrite. We can have also calcium spikes, which are these slower waveforms, and they happen primarily within the apical trunk of these pyramidal neurons. And we can also have NMDA spikes, which are shown here in green. So these NMDA spikes are characteristic because of their plateau potential. They are long lasting. And they happen primarily in the three dendrites of either the basal tree of a pyramidal neuron or the apical tree. So we have at least three different types of dendritic spikes, all of which are sudden nonlinear events, and whose role it remains largely unexplained. Why do we have them in the dendrites? What do they provide to these neurons? There was a very nice in vivo study recently from the lab of Matthew Larkum and the collaborator that demonstrated how important these adrenic spikes can be for brain function. So what they did in Matthew's lab, sorry, yes, was to uh, train mice to detect the presence of a pole, right? They touched it with their whisker and they could tell whether a pole was there or not. They placed it at such distance from the face of the animal that it was very, very hard to tell, right? It, it, it touched it slightly and the animal should be able to sense this pole. And they figure out by observing the apical dendrites in layer five, uh, somatosensory cortex of this neuron, that when the animal reported the pole by leaking, there was a big response, the blue one, whereas when the animal did not detect the pole, even if it was there, there was a very weak response. And they figured that this strong response might have something to do with the dendrites. So to test this, they applied chemicals and they shut off the apical debridic tree of these neurons, right? Either with chemicals or with optogenetic manipulation, they shut them off. And once they close this debridic activity, the ability of the animal to detect the pole dropped substantially. It was not because the cell body was not active, it, it was because the dendrite was silent. They also tried the opposite, optogenetically activated the debridic tree and they figured and they, they showed that the response of the animal, its ability to detect the pole increased dramatically. So the take home conclusion from this study, which was published in Science in 2016, was that the dritic spikes that happen in the distal apical path of these pyramidal neurons, layer five pyramidal neurons, are causally related, causally linked to sensory perception. This is one of the few studies that actually showed in vivo that the dritic spikes are important for behavioral functions. Okay, so they are there. We have evidence that they're important for, you know, for brain function, but how do they achieve this? What it is that the dritic spikes bring to pyramidal neurons. 
So this is what we're interested in my lab, how dendrites contribute to brain function. And we tackle this question using mostly computational methods. Our computational methods include various types of models. We have simple neuron models, which we can see here. For example, detailed, morphologically detailed models of pyramidal neurons in various areas, the hippocampus, the prefrontal cortex, or the visual cortex. And these models are uh, built using uh, differential equations in uh, simulators such as neuron, which allow you essentially to describe in detail the genetics of ion channels, sodium, potassium, uh, uh, calcium, and various receptors. And we have these tools that allow us to build such uh, models. We also have simple neural models for interneurons, so both excited area and inhibitory neurons using this approach. We can connect these models together to build small microcircuits like the one that we see here. Here we have four models of pyramidal neurons of the prefrontal cortex in the neuron simulation environment. And what you see them, when you see them lighting up, it means that they just fire an action potential up in somebody. These are detailed morphological detailed models. Or we can have more simplified models where you see that the morphology of pyramidal neurons is just a cell body and a few dendrites, and then a bunch of interneurons. We use this approach when we want to build larger network models where computational complexity is a problem, right? If you have thousands of differential equations, it takes a very long time to simulate the activity of these cells. But if you simplify them computationally while keeping the important components, that it's much easier to simulate the activity of a large network. So these are the microcircuit kind of level of models where we have some biophysical mechanisms included, but reduced morphology. And also in the lab, we have this kind of model. We have the reduced morphology. And here you can see just five dendrites, for example. And we can also add to these models synaptic plasticity rules. And what you see here are synaptic inputs, for example, in, in, uh, in red. And when they grow, it's because they undergo plasticity, LTP. And when they become smaller, it's because they undergo LTD, so depression, either um, potentiation or depression. And this we can also describe with computational methods. So these are the tools that we have in the lab. Detailed single neural model, simplified, reduced simplified microcircuit models, and larger scale network models with synaptic plasticity. And I want to present a few of the examples from, from the lab that show us what can we learn from these models with respect to the computations. So I will start with, the, with one example uh, that it has been of interest in my lab for many, many years, and that has to do with signal integration. So one of the important questions that we asked uh, many years ago, since I was still a postdoc with Patrick Mel, was how do the dendrites of pyramidal neurons integrate their inputs? Are they just summing them linearly, which would be just the, the black uh, example here? If they sum them linearly, if you have two inputs, then the output will be equal to the sum of these two inputs, right? But then they could also be integrating inputs sublinearly, which is the blue um, curve shown here. So as you increase the, the number of inputs that go in, the response becomes smaller and smaller, and this would be a sublinear integration. Or you could have the opposite, which as we increase the number of stimuli that go into the dendrite, there is a threshold upon which you have a big jump, for example, a spike, and then you have a superlinear integration. All of these possibilities exist within the dendrites of neurons, and in fact, all of them have been reported. So the question for us many years ago, which is, was if you have a pyramidal neuron, what, what does it dendrites, uh, what do its dendrites do? How do we summate their inputs? So to answer this question, we started with a computational model. We took the detailed morphology of the CO1 pyramidal neuron in the hippocampus, which is the one shown here. We simulated all of the ionic conductances that we know are present in the cells, which are quite a few, and the synaptic inputs, both excitatory and inhibitory. So we built an in silico model of a pyramidal neuron. We constrained these equations with data from the literature and asked. The question that we asked was the following. What would happen if in this model neuron, I have two inputs, right? And they come into the dendrites. If I place them on two different dendrites versus placing them within the same dendrite, would I see exactly the same output at the cell body? If I saw exactly the same output at the cell body, I would assume that this neuron is just summing its input. 
It doesn't matter where I place them because the dendrites don't do anything special. But to our surprise, we found a big difference. We found that if you place the twin foods across different dendrites and look at the cell body, then what you get is a linear summation, the green curve. But if you place them within the same branch, exactly the same inputs, the same strength, then what you get is a supralinear integration, this sigmoidal curve here. Initially, it starts out linear, then there is a jump, and then there is a plateau. And at this jump, what essentially happens is that you have the inputs being strong enough that you open the local conductances and you have the induction of a spike, the local spike within the dendrite. And as you increase the inputs, this spike is, keeps being generated, but its amplitude is the same, therefore you read the saturation. This is why you have a nonlinear integration in the dendrite of these cells. But the important take home message from this study, which was unknown at the time, was that location matters. Where you place your input within a neuron makes a difference to the cell, or the cell is able to understand the spatial arrangement of its input, its input and, and discriminate between them. If they go within different branches, it will have a very different response than if, we, if they arrive within the same dendrite. So if we don't know this, we would ask, underestimate the computational power of the cells because we would think that their response would be the same in both the green and the red situation. And this prediction that came out from the work, essentially uh, saying that we have a sigmoidal integration within the dendrites, it came out in 2003, so it's a very old study. And it's still the interest of the uh, community at the time. And experiments were done, both uh, in pyramidal neurons of the neocortex and in pyramidal neurons of the hippocampus, the same cell that we simulated. And they verified our prediction. They reported experimentally that indeed you have the sigmoidal integration if you place inputs within the dendrite, if you place them to separate dendrites, then you have a sublinear integration. So it was a very important, let's say, outcome of the model because it predicted a behavior that was unknown at the time and which led to its experimental verification. And now we know that dendrites of pyramidal neurons are not linear signaling devices. They have strong nonlinearity. In this case, a sigmoidal nonlinearity. And this is not only for pyramidal neurons. A talented PhD student in the lab, Alexander Dulius, did what he thought that means this may be the case also for interneurons. Interneurons are the uh, inhibitory cells of the brain. They put their break and they stop the excitability of, of pyramidal neurons. And they're usually more simple in terms of their morphology, although they can have a very elaborated action, action which is what's shown in gray here. So Alexandra selected morphologies of interneurons from the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex, eight different cells, and she simulated using the same approach in neuron, morphologically detailed models of these cells. And she asked the same question. How do the dendrites of the cells integrate their inputs? And to our surprise, she found out that in these cells, we have two types of dendrites. We have dendrites that are capable of inducing these dendritic spikes, which then lead to supralinear responses like the ones we have seen in pyramidal neurons in both of the areas that we looked at. But there are also other dendrites in the cells, the ones shown in purple, where we don't have generation of dendritic spikes. And in fact, the integration is sublinear. This is important because, oh, sorry. this is important because it shows that in fact, interneurons may be even smarter than pyramidal neurons in the sense that they have both supra and sublinear nonlinearities within the same detritic tree. And the question then is why? Why do we need this kind of nonlinearities? What is the added advantage that they provide for the brain, if any, right? Because they might have been uh, uh, there accidentally. I will come to this question in a second. First, I wanted to show that even for this prediction in the same year that our work was published, there was experimental evidence supporting our idea from interneurons in the hippocampus, PV cells in particular. Um, uh, this paper that was published in eLife by the lab of Dimitri Kuhlman showed that you can also find in these cells two types of nonlinearities. One is supralinear, the one shown in red here, and the other one is slightly sublinear, we can call it linear, in the same cell. In this case, these dendrites were located in different locations. Well, the blue ones are mostly apical. The, the, sorry, I should not this. Let me stop it. 
while the other ones are, are proximal, basal. So this is to say that, again, the prediction of the model was largely correct. There are no linearities in interneurons. Why is this important? Well, it is important to know that dendrites can perform these types of nonlinearities because we can describe them as individual computing units. What does the SOMA does in a neuron? It is integrates the input and passes them through a threshold to generate an action potential. And that's why we describe the cell body with a sigmoidal nonlinearity, which should be reminiscent of what we do in artificial neural networks, right? A node is described by a nonlinearity. Now, if we show that dendrites have similar nonlinearities like this one, the dendrites of a single cell, then it is highly likely that an individual neuron may be acting as an artificial neural network, whereby each one of its dendrites is essentially doing its own local computations before they actually arrive at the cell body. Why is it important that the neuron acts as a neuronal network? Well, the answer is obvious because a neuronal network has a much higher capacity than one node, and we will see also that in a second. This was a hypothesis that we proposed back in 2003, and to test it, we used our detailed compartmental model, we bombarded it with a large number of different sets of inputs, and measured the output, the mean firing rate of the cell body, and we asked, does a network model like this, a two-stage artificial neural network, predict the mean firing rate of the compartmental neuron well? How closely can it predict it? And how does a linear model, which would be comprised by just one uh, nonlinear node, predict it? And we find out that this two-stage artificial neural network was very good at predicting the mean firing rate of the compartmental neuron, the correlation coefficient between the actual, the one produced by the compartmental model, and, and the one produced by the artificial neural network model was in the order of 0 0.93, which is a very high, uh, correlation coefficient for these two, suggesting that essentially individual neurons are best described by artificial neuronal networks with at least one layer where the computation is performed by the dendrites. Similarly, in interneurons, we did exactly the same. We asked how well would an interneuron be described by a two layer neuronal network versus a linear one? for all of the eight different morphologies that we studied. And we found that in this case as well, interneurons were much better described by these two layer uh, mathematical abstractions of a neuron rather than the linear uh, networks. Although the linear occasionally could be very good. So it's not always the case that it is required that we have nonlinearities to describe a neuron, right? It is under some cases where we have many of these dendrites acting superlinearly, and when you study the conditions under which these nonlinearities are beneficial, I mean, if the animal is, is sleeping and nothing important is happening in the brain, it may well be the case that a linear approximation is good enough. But when an animal is performing a very difficult uh, task, where these nonlinearities would be needed, then we expect to see that the mathematical abstraction of the two layer would be a better one for describing how the neurons perform. Okay, so we predict from our models that both pyramidal cells and interneurons are more likely to behave like multi-layer art artificial neural networks rather than simple point neurons, which has been the dominant view for many years. As I said, what are the functional implications of having such neurons in the brain. I mean, why would the brain want these neurons instead of having many more linear units? Is it something that you can buy within these nonlinearities? So to answer this question, uh, first, the first thing that we did when I was still a postdoc was to look at the computational capacity of linear versus nonlinear neurons, right? Single neurons or small networks. We presented these mathematical models with many uh, patterns, patterns belonging to, to two classes, let's say oranges versus apples, and we ask these models, how well can you discriminate? How many of these patterns can you discriminate very well? And as we know very, very well now from uh, uh, the field of machine learning, a nonlinear model can do much better compared to a linear one. And in our case, where we essentially simulated a neuron with a few dendrites, the boost in capacity between a linear and a nonlinear model was in the order of 
45. So 45 times higher capacity in discriminating between binary patterns. This was the theoretical analysis we did back then. Now, in my lab, we also look at the functional implications within a brain circuit level. So we built a small network that comprised of both pyramidal neurons and interneurons. Our, in, our pyramidal neurons had nonlinearities, as we described them many years ago, so these model nonlinearities. And our interneurons also had nonlinearities, both supralinear or sigmoidal and saturating, which was the sublinear. And we asked in this network model, what does the presence of nonlinearities in the interneurons alone confer with respect to its ability to learn multiple memories? So we trained this network, we furnished it with plasticity rules, and there are many plasticity rules out there in the literature that we incorporated in this model. I will not go into details because this might be boring to many of you, but the idea is that we have rules that both strengthen and weaken synaptic inputs locally within the dendrites, depending on the ability of plasticity proteins. We have homeostatic plasticity, which means that we scale up or down all the weights in the network to avoid runaway excitation, which is also reported in the brain. We have plasticity of excitability at the cell body, which means that if a neuron learns a memory, it will remain more excitable for some time, for several hours, before it goes back to its baseline. And we also have the ability for rewiring, which means that axons from other neurons, they touch onto their postsynaptic targets, and if their firing excites that cell, then they stay there, they strengthen the inputs. If not, if they don't contribute to the excitability, then they pull back and they try to find another partner which is also reported experimentally. So I have these four types of plasticity rules that we incorporate in this network model. And we train the model to learn a memory. Learning a memory essentially means that we present uh, uh, an input to the network for several seconds. And this input has two parts. Let's say it's Q number one and Q number two. During the learning phase, both of them are presented together. We have the plasticity rules operating and then to test learning, we have a recall phase where we just present half of the memory, the first cue, and we look at which neurons respond. If the neurons that respond are similar in terms of their population and activity as the ones that were responding during learning, then we consider that this memory has been learned. The system can recognize this memory by partial cues. This is what we define in learning a memory. And there's always a subpopulation of neurons that learns the memory. It's not all of them, it's not the entire circuit. Otherwise, we have a saturation, right? So we have some neurons that have encoded this memory, and we look at their properties. Their properties would be how many of these neurons are responsive, how strongly they fire, and how different is their activity compared to the rest of the neurons. So how sparse is this memory? And we look at these properties when we have linear dendrites in our interneurons or nonlinear dendrites. And when we place their inputs in different ways, dispersed all over the place or clustered within a few dendrites, but this is not as important. The clear comparison is between the linear and the nonlinear. So what we find out is that if we have linear dendrites in interneurons again, then the size of this engram, this memory engram is very high it takes 45% of the neurons in this network to learn a memory. Whereas if you add more linearities in the dendrites, then the size of this engram is significantly smaller. It's only now 30% of the neurons that are needed to capture this engram. What else happens to the properties of these engram neurons? Well, their mean firing rate. If you have linear dendrites, these neurons fire at nearly 11 hertz. So they waste a lot of energy to respond to essentially capture this memory. If we have nonlinear dendrites, the mean firing rate drops to seven hertz, between seven and eight hertz, or slightly higher depending on how you arrange your inputs. But in both cases, it's substantially less than when you have uh, linear dendrites. What does it mean? It means that you save energy by requesting that your neurons fire at lower frequencies to represent the memory equally well. And when we also look at the sparsity of these neurons, which means 
how different is their firing rate compared to the rest, and we want this sparsity number to be very high, we see that when we have linear dendrites, we have a good sparsity, it's nearly 80%, 75%. But this number becomes even better when you add nonlinear dendrites. So there are important advantages for the brain to have nonlinear dendrites. And these advantage and advantages are essentially measured in terms of resources. So the brain saves resources by having nonlinear dendrites. It's not that it couldn't do the same job. Uh, without nonlinear dendrites, it would be able to do it if it had a large number of dendrites and a large number of energy to waste. But it is true that our brain sits within a small skull. It runs on very low energy demands and therefore it needs to optimize its performance. And dendrites are there to help in this optimization. So what have we learned from these models? Energy savings, I just mentioned in summary. Doing the same job with fewer resources. But there's not only that, there's more to that. And this comes from recent studies that we've done in human neurons. This is a study that was recently published in Science, and it's a collaboration with the lab of Matsular from Humboldt University, and a very talented uh, postdoc at the time, Albert Gidon, who is now setting up his own lab uh, in Israel. So Albert, what did he do? He studied the properties of dendrites in layer 2, 3 pyramidal neurons of the human cortex. These are slices from the cortex uh, uh, of uh, humans with either epilepsy or cancer. And they make sure that they take out a small part which is healthy compared to the part that is epileptic or has uh, cancer to ensure that they remove the entire damaged area. So these are the healthy slices that we're looking at. And what Alfred did was essentially to inject current in the apical dendrites of these neurons and observe the response. And what he found was something really interesting. It, it is a new type of dendritic spike, which we call the DCAP. The DCAP because it is calcium-based action potential. Um, we don't know exactly which are the channels that underlie these spikes, but we know they're different from, from the ones we know because they rise very slowly compared to the sodium dendritic spikes, spikes, for example, and they drop very fast. So they have a slow onset and a faster decay. And more interestingly, they have a very unique property, which is, sorry, uh, which is that as you increase the stimulus intensity, this pipe that are projects on the dendrite, these dendritic spikes have an amplitude that decreases, becomes smaller and smaller. And this has not been seen in other types of, of, of uh, spikes. Normally what happens if you increase the intensity is that the amplitude stays exactly the same and therefore there is a result. But here we have a decrease in amplitude. A decrease in amplitude means that the transfer function of these dendrites is different. And this is how it looks like. So if you have a very weak stimulation, you have no response, the amplitude is zero. If you have the ideal amount of stimulation, then you have the highest response, the normalized amplitude is one. This is what would happen here. And as you increase the stimulus intensity, the response, the amplitude of these spikes becomes smaller and smaller. So this is like a, a half Gaussian, I'd say, if you, you want to see it like that. It's a strange transfer function. The typical one is sigmoidal. It will get here and stay up there. So we're wondering with, with Albert and Matthew, what could this transfer function do for human neurons? Are there new types of problems that these neurons would be able to solve? And, and one could even be as bold enough to state that, is this what makes us human? Of course, we cannot answer this question, but it is interesting to find this kind of spikes. So we figured that one computation that would be ideally suited for such a transfer function would be the XOR problem. What is the XOR problem? It's a gate where you have two pathways coming in. When none of these pathways, you can think of them as input. When none of them is active, then the gate remains closed. You have a zero. When one pathway is activated, then the gate opens. You have a response of one. If the other pathway is activated, again, you have a, a, the gate opening. You have a response of one. But when both of them are activated together, the gate closes again. And this would be the case here because you can think of pathway A as carrying current equal to one, so it will induce an optional response. Pathway B doing the same, but both of them together 
they have an intensity of two, and therefore these spikes are now back to baseline. We have no response. This is a hypothesis that we have that this transfer function would solve this problem. Of course, it's a very nice in terms of theory, but does a real neuron do this? So to answer this question, a very talented senior uh, researcher in the lab, Nancy Papuzzi, developed a biophysical model of these cells, layer two pyramidal neurons in humans. We don't know a lot about these neurons, so we don't know the channels that underlie this, uh, this current. So we simulated it mathematically, such that when we induce a particular amount of current, you have the maximum response. And as you increase this current, the response becomes smaller and smaller. So we simulated this in a compartmental neuron. And we applied the same stimulation protocol, which is to have two pathways, pathway X and Y, which is just the number of synapses, delivered onto the dendrites of the cell, stimulated the synapses and look at the cell body and also looked at the dendrite. And what we found is that if you stimulate either X or Y pathway alone, you have a strong response in the dendrites, so many spikes, and a very strong response at the cell body. But if you activate them together, X and Y, then the response of the dendrite now becomes very weak, so below the threshold. And at the cell body, this results in a very weak finding, which essentially confirms our hypothesis that having such functions in the dendrites of these cells would enable them to solve the XOR problem. The XOR problem is a highly nonlinear computation that is now solvable only by at least two layer neural networks um, in machine learning. So this essentially advances the computational capabilities of these neurons, and in fact, not the neurons, but the dendrite themselves, because it is within the dendrite that this computation can take place. And the other interesting finding from this work is that inhibition now comes into play with a new role, because if you apply inhibition together with these two pathways, so if you, if you now try to um, decrease the excitability of the neuron, you push back the excitability of the branch into the activated regime. So if now we have pathway X and pathway Y and inhibition, because you go, essentially you go here, it's like pushing the net excitability back into this window, you can land inside the favored window of, of excitation of this neuron and induce a strong response again. So inhibition acts as excitation. It has the opposite role. If both pathways are active, if only one pathway is active, it would not do that because now it would push it further out of excitability and you have a very weak response. So this adds an other degree of flexibility into human neurons. They can solve the XOR problem having these interesting dendrites and they can use inhibition as an excitation mechanism. They can play with many different degrees of freedom to uh, maximize their computational power. So the take home message is that the human neuron and in fact the dendrite can solve the XOR problem. And in summary, with respect to the duty computations at the single neuron level, what I have talked to you about today is that dendrites of both pyramidal and interneurons integrate their signals in active nonlinear ways. Because of this degree of nonlinearities, individual neurons act as multi-stage artificial neural networks and not as simple point integrators. And this nonlinearity is expand the processing and storage capacity of these neurons. In particular, for human neurons, the degree calcium action potentials may endow dendrites to have a much higher computational capacity than we thought of before. And these nonlinearities contribute to memory processing by saving resources. Don't hurry up, I still have more to tell you. This was all about single neurons, pretty much, the computation of single neurons. Why do we care about this? It is important because now there is a strong activity in the field uh, with respect to artificial intelligence, where we want to build systems that are closer to human and we want to take inspiration from neuroscience to do this. So it is important to appreciate the computational power of the neural tissue to build better machine learning system or systems or even hardware systems that harness these capabilities, right? So that's why it's important to understand simple neural computation. And I don't know if I have the time. I want to tell you one more short story about the circuit level. We have the time. Yes, okay. 
So I wanted to also mention quickly another study that we've done together with experimental collaborators and it has to do with network computations. Now, this is not clearly related to dendrites of interneurons, but it's just to show the power of computational modeling in order to figure out what happens at the network level. And since it was in my abstract, uh, I figured I should tell you a little bit about it. So this is a study that was done in collaboration with uh, Tristan Schumann at Mount Sinai and Pinman Boshani at UCLA. And what they looked at is spatial navigation in epilepsy. So in mice that are epileptic, they image the activity of neurons into their hippocampus, and they wanted to understand what is it that happens in epileptic mice, and they have deficits in their ability to navigate space. So in their studies, they, had, they measured essentially synchronization in the hippocampus, because there is a strong theory that, that suggests that um, epilepsy causes disruptions in the synchronization across different uh, circuits in the brain. And this disruption and synchronicity may be the reason for spatial deficits. But nobody has actually shown if this is the case and where it may come from. So they measured the correlation in the inhibitory activity of neurons in the CA1 and the dendrogyrus, two areas of the hippocampus, in healthy and epileptic mice. And indeed, they found that there is a loss of synchronization as a result of a place. At the same time, they looked at place cells. Place cells are neurons in the hippocampus that fire when the animal crosses a particular location. They encode that particular location. We know that we have such neurons in the hippocampus, and they found out that in the epileptic animals, you have much fewer of these place cells. So the, their number essentially goes down. But not only their number, but also their ability to encode place. So both their information content and their stability across time and different runs decreases in epileptic animals for play cells, but also for all of the cells that they image. So they have a deficit in synchronization and they have important deficits in the neurons that encode place in these cells. But they didn't really know where this com comes from. What's happening in the circuit that could create such a phenotype? So that's when we joined forces. And a very talented postdoctoral doctor fellow in the lab, Spiros Harris, developed the circuit model of the hippocampus, which as you can see here, it's more simplified as I presented in the beginning. So we have parental neurons with just a few dendrites and six different types of interneurons that are incorporated in the circuit. We incorporated interneurons because there is a strong literature that suggests that interneurons are the reason for this deficit in uh, epilepsy. And we wanted to figure out if this is the case, and if so, which of these interneurons might be the reason for the deficits. There are interneurons that control the dendritic compartment of pyramidal neurons, others that control the somatic compartment, and others that control the axon. Which of those are the ones responsible? So we made our model behave like the real thing. So we gave it input from the internal cortex, input from the hippocampus so that it produces this place-like activity. So the response were neurons that are tuned to a particular place. We have many of those. And then we try to mimic what we know happens in epilepsy. What we know happens in epilepsy is essentially a 30 millisecond desynchronization between the CA1 and the dendrogyrus areas of the hippocampus. So we added that in our network model. And we also know that we have a reduction in two types of interneurons, somatostatin interneurons, the ones that control the dendrites, and PV interneurons, the ones that control the cell body. So we have these three different things that happen in epilepsy. We incorporate them in our model and we ask which one of these three different mechanisms can explain the deficits. Is it the desynchronization or is it the loss of inhibition, which is what the literature claims to be the main reason. So what we found in our model was that with respect to the reduced number of place cells in epileptic animals, what seemed to be responsible was the desynchronization effect and not the reduction in inhibition. With respect to the information content and the stability, again, this was the case. This is what was shown in experiments and this is what our model found. In all cases, it was a change in the synchronization that explained the data and not the reduction in inhibition, which is what the literature claims. And this was found extremely interesting for our collaborators and our reviewers. So they said, oh, okay, 
What would happen if you have a stronger loss of inhibition? Is it because this inhibition is moderate? So in the model, we simulated that. We simulated a change in inhibition that is higher than 25%. Uh, uh, sorry. Ah, okay, sorry, I'm not including the story. I'll take that back. I thought I had a slide on that, but I didn't have it. So this prediction from the experiment, which essentially suggested that a reduction in inhibition was not responsible for the phenotype, uh, the reduced ASCII experimental is to do this experiment. So go in healthy animals, decrease inhibition by 25% and see whether you have the deficit, which is exactly what we did. These are the experimental data and they showed that indeed, if you have a reduction which is only 25%, then nothing happens to the properties of PLESA. So the model is right. This was another interesting prediction that came out for our, from our model that drove experimentalists to do an additional test and confirm our hypothesis. So uh, I just wanted to present that as another way of uh, using computational models to, uh, to infer interesting findings that can drive uh, the computational uh, field uh, to take the next step. So in summary, I hope I have convinced you that uh, our work in terms of developing models, not only biophysical, but also reduced ones, is important. It's important because it can produce a variety of tools that are available to the community to use to generate interesting predictions and pursue interesting uh, findings. And we have generated a large number of such predictions which have led to experimental confirmation and a lot of new, a lot of new insights in our field. And, and we feel in general that uh, computational work, and this is a selling point for doing modeling, right? Uh, doing models is important because models provide a bridge between experimental measurements that take place at various levels, at the molecular, at the single neuron, at the network level, and the phenotypic effects that are observed uh, by these models. And our work, I think, demonstrates how important and powerful such a bridge can be. And I just want to close with a conclusion that I often get asked, what is the right uh, level of modeling? And I don't think that there is a single answer when we try to find the appropriate level of modeling to use. And I've presented many different levels of models in my talk. I think that the only universal advice that one can use is that the best model is the one that is detailed enough to address the question that you're interested in while requiring the smallest possible number of parameters. And this is known as Occam's razor. And if you want to find out more about uh, the role of dendrites uh, and computational modeling, we have a recent review paper that I encourage you to read. And with that, I would like to thank the people that have done all the work. These are the my lab members. Today I presented the work of Alexander Zilibaiti, Spiros Havlis, George Garcia-Lakis, and Nancy Papati, but all of them have been uh, very uh, important uh, in, in whatever we have achieved so far. I would like to thank our sponsors. Uh, this is our website and our Twitter, and there are some PhD positions available, available in the lab. Uh, I would like to shamelessly advertise. If you're interested, uh, please let me, know, let me know. And thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Your time was a very interesting talk, and I think we learned a lot that we didn't know. So let's open a bit uh, for questions. So uh, who wants to ask a question? Let me know. I, I don't see you all, but uh, if you talk or at least Ingo, I see you. Jutta, first of all, thanks for this really fascinating overview. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, you, you mentioned that, for example, people have done actually in neurons if it had uh, taken more of those. And you say, therefore, the uh, dendritic trees contribute to uh, saving resources. Right. Um, do you have an, an estimate, at least for the functionalities you've been talking about, how much resources are, for example, being saved in terms of energy or in terms of volume? Because I think it is also a question of volume, right? If you would use uh, pointing words right. instead. Yes, well, volume uh, we didn't measure, so I can't say. Energy is very hard to calculate because we need to know the expenditure for action potentials. It's not impossible to do, but we haven't done it actually. I can only tell you in terms of, of the number of neurons, for example, which is what I showed, uh, I think, in my slide already. But I think this all depends on the kind of model that you use, right? So I am hesitant to say, I mean, the, the size improvement here was in the order of, let's say, 20%. 
in improvement. So uh, the firing rate is much higher, it's more than 50%. The engram, uh, the sparsity is smaller. But these are just numbers that we measured in a cell group with 500 neurons, you know, with two dendrites. So I would be hesitant to put numbers on these settings. I can see that they exist, but how much would depend on the system that you are studying. So um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a better answer for you for that. Thank you very much. Right. Anybody else? Are yeah. I... Oh. Okay. Santiago, go ahead, and then. Okay. Can... Yeah, it's it, continuing with with uh, Ingo's question. Uh, well, first of all, thanks thanks for the talk. It was really great. Uh, Really, really impressive, impressive work. Congratulations. Um, going into this point of, of, of uh, energy saving and, and the evolutionary uh, benefit of that, for me, it's difficult to understand that perspective since, I mean, the, the energy consumption that you require to depolarize and repolarize a dendrite due to the size of the dendrite and the amount of current that you need to pass through the membrane to generate a voltage, enough voltage depolarization is huge. So if, if say energy is, is a reason, uh, the system would, would do much better with just soma and axons. And well, no, actually that's not true, Santiago, because the soma is much bigger than the dendrite. I know, I know, but you need the soma to hold the nuclei and the genes. So there I is agree. But, but to induce an action potential in the soma where the input resistance is much smaller than the dendrite would require much la much larger current than it would require in the dendrite, which is very thin, and right. where the, a small amount of current would induce a local spike. So you but have so to also consider the morphology. Sure, and the soma solves this problem by putting a lot of sodium channels in the initial segment of the axon. So what I'm what I'm trying to say is that probably evolution would could have fine solutions to to if 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 the role of the dendrite is to decrease the consumption and the efficiency of the energy use, I don't see how dendrites. I think I mean it's just it's simply that it's difficult to me to understand how dendrites could just be improving the consumption with all these beautiful and complex architectures right so I, i'm more in support of the the other argument that you say that it adds more computational power rather i mean i think it's both i think it's both because the skull has a minimum size the soma is big you have to pack computational units within a small a limited space right uh -huh. and you have at the same time save energy and find an optimal way of doing it and if you can use dendrites to both increase computational power and doing it with a, a smaller amount of energy, that, that, that that's ideal and that's what a good evolution figure out is a good solution. So I'm not saying it's one versus the other. I think that, that both uh, are there. Mm -hmm. But that's still my personal opinion based on these findings. Maybe there is an even third argument that it's better and I would love to hear it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Andre. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I, I have a more simple question as somebody who's not so familiar with dendritic computation. Um, is there some reason to believe that this has evolved in, like during evolution? Are there some animals that have neurons without dendritic computation? That's a wonderful question. And uh, from what I know, it has not been studied extensively. I know, for example, in C. elegans, uh, which is a very simple dendrite uh, organism where we know all the complexity of its neurons, that, they're, that, that their cells are very simple. They have two or three dendrites. Those dendrites do not even have spikes. They communicate through calcium potentials, but they're not fast raising spikes. And I mean, apparently, C. elegans is not very smart, but we can't really say that this is because they don't have dendrites, right? We need a very thorough, consistent uh, study to answer this question, which has not been done. What has been done is to compare the complexity of the dendritic morphology. Guy Aston in Australia has several beautiful studies on this across species. And we know that as you go to higher species, the complexity increases, the morphological complexity, right? They are more elaborate trees, they are larger, they have more branch points and so on and so forth. Again, it's a correlation, it's not a causation. So I am suspecting the answer would be yes, but nobody has done it. 
<laughs> okay, any other question? Ah, Christian, yes, Me? I see you. Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I like a lot. And I have a question about uh, the computation in dendrites. In principle, in this model, are in active dendrites, if yes, I am right. Yes. Yes. And has property like the sparsity that improves a lot with this, this uh, Nordly and uh, computations. But for instance, in I don't know if it's similar or could be similar in passive dendrites like granular cells that, for instance, the sparsity is a uh, high property in the neurons. So I don't know if that passive dendrites could have, could have similar properties. Mm -hmm. with the non-linear computations. Right. So passive dendrites in the sense that they can perform sublinear integration because that's what passive does. It's, it's not linear, it's sublinear, right? Because it saturates because of distance. There's a nice study by Romain Cazé showing that if you have sublinear dendrites, you can also solve complex non-linear problems. You just need more of them, right? Because uh, sublinear is also non-linear and therefore it has uh, a significant computational power beyond linear. And if you have uh, the right amounts and, and a combination of those dendrites, you can still solve uh, nonlinear problems. Uh, in fact, in this study, the one that I'm showing here, our interneurons have both supra and sub. We have both types. And we did not discriminate between the two to say, you know, which one is doing better versus the other. Uh, but in, uh, in artificial neural networks, for example, we know that sublinear transfer functions are also very good in solving complex problems. So it's not a particular the supralinearity or the, or the spiking mechanism uh, that it's the only powerful thing for the neuron. And probably they serve different functions. And that, that would be my, my guess, that you need a, the induction of a degree spike, let's like say, for example, to detect coincidence detection. When two things come together, you suddenly drive a degree spike and it's a signal of coincidence. Sublinear could be something else for longer time scale integration. Um, I'm pretty sure that there will be different roles for those two, but, but I don't I haven't looked into that, you know, extensively to separate them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other question? I have one. Uh, Yota, for many years, people have been working with point neuron models, studying, for instance, and we too, studying the aspect of synchronization in, in circuits, in brain circuits, and so on but they never considering this uh, dendrite property. What would happen if one reanalyzes those results in terms of dendritic mode? I mean, do, do you think, because it's not the same asking about synchronization of axon potential than properties of the dendrite side. So do you think this, this study should be somehow re-evaluated considering uh, these more sophisticated models? Uh, it depends on the question that was asked. Because uh, what we've shown also here is that the, the improvement is mainly, is mainly in resource savings rather than a kind of computation, with the exception of the human neurons, right? Where we, there we see something different. Uh, but in the other models, the, the mice models, what, what, what is solvable by dendrites, let's say, is also solvable by a large network of point neurons. So I don't think that the conclusions made by those models are wrong. They are just solved with more resources or more units than the brain would actually need to use. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I mean, it's, all, it's the same as thinking of a multi layer artificial neural network. If you add more hidden layers in between, you solve the problem faster, better, easier, but you, you may be able still to do it with fewer units. It's something similar to that. Okay. If you have enough of them, because the cell bodies are non-linear anyway, they have a sigmoidal activation function, you would still get the job done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any, anybody else want to ask a question? I just uh, say something because I don't see you all. So, so if, if that is not the case, I, I would like to thank again uh, Yota for, the, for being here with us virtually. It was a very interesting talk and, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.
טוב טיפה להגיד.